from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I have the great honor and pleasure of introducing a, a colleague and a friend and a distinguished folklorist, Jens Land. And I learned in this introduction a whole lot of new information about Jens. But Jens holds a PhD in folklore and American studies from Indiana University. And Jens and I were, in fact, classmates there. And he has worked as a freelance field worker in folklore and oral history in 23 states. His uh, field work prowess is legendary, um, preceding him everywhere. In addition to teaching in five universities, Jens was also the director of the Washington State Folklife Council, and until his recent retirement, developed and managed the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission's Folk and Traditional Arts in the Parks program. He's the author of several books, including The Folk Arts of Washington State, Flatheads and Spoonies, and numerous articles and reviews. And I should also say he is a recipient of the Benjamin Botkin Public Folklore Award that is um, given by the American Folklore Society as well. Jens also has worked extensively in cultural tourism and developed the Washington State's Innovative Highway Auto, Audio Heritage, Heritage Tours, excuse me. So you get from this description that Jens could speak about any number of things. But today he's going to focus on a topic with which he's widely identified in the world of folklore scholarship, and that is occupational folk poetry. And because the topic focuses on poetry, I'm happy to say that the Poetry and Literature Center is serving as a co-sponsor for this lecture today. And I just want to uh, have a give a shout out to Rob Casper, who's sitting over there, uh, and is the director of the Poetry and Literature Center. And I hope that this is the first of many to come. So. Um, Enough of all of that, and please let me introduce Jens Lund. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> that was quite an introduction. Uh, I hope I can live up to the expectations. <clears throat> okay, now let me make sure I know what I'm doing here. Uh, and can operate this machinery. I've gone to Valhalla. I've gone like a man. I've done what I could, and I did what I can. So ends a Viking funeral, a gripping tale of a down-on-his-luck North Pacific commercial fisherman in a poem by former commercial fisherman Gino Leach of Chinook, Washington. This dramatic story is told entirely in the rhymed quatrains of the ballad style. Many of us are familiar with this style from literary poets like Rudyard Kipling and Robert Service, and we'll hear Gino actually recite the poem at the very end of the talk. Uh, dangers and difficulties of certain physically challenging occupations are sometimes expressed in the traditions of composing and reciting poems, often in the traditional ballad form of rhymed couplets. But the tradition also, you know, best known as the cowboy poetry of the American West. Uh, um, this tradition also occurs among other occupational groups and can yet be found among workers in the Pacific Northwest, such as loggers and commercial fishers, and minors. Uh, such repertoires arguably belong to the genre of folk poetry. And this term has been defined by Pauline Greenhill in a 1987 article in Western Folklore as, quote, locally made poetry on everyday topics meant to be read and recited. In Roger D. V. Renwick's 1980 book, English Folk Poetry, Its Structure and Meaning, the author does not offer one simple definition but defines folk poetry in part by its content. Quote, topics and sentiments that are express, explicitly situated in the poet's bounded and knowable world. Although some of the topics described in Northwest occupational poetry are hardly every day, they are nonetheless part of the daily way of life for people in these occupations who compose, perform, and enjoy them. It's important to note that until the uh, well into the 20th century, locally composed poems of the kind usually dismissed as doggerel were re regularly published in local newspapers, magazines, and trade journals. 
Uh, folklorist Pauline Greenhill refers to the occasional poet who writes a poem in short order to celebrate, commemorate, or memorialize a particular occasion of importance to a community or a family or other group of people. It was often a local school teacher or a librarian who commemorated an important local event, a wedding, a funeral, a wedding anniversary, by composing a poem in short order. Although they had become rare by the end of the 20th century, these occasional poems and poets were once common in the English-speaking world and elsewhere, and few literate people, especially in provincial areas, uh, could avoid encountering them. In fact, speculation about the history of cowboy poetry almost always refers to 19th century Western newspaper and cattle industry journals. This kind of poetry is an example of how, in the words of Karl Marx, in an essay on Louis Napoleon's 1852 coup, quote, the common people make their own history and do so under circumstances found, given, and transmitted from the past. It's also important to note that only a tiny percentage of loggers, fishers, miners, and ranch people have actually composed occupational folk poetry, which suggests that the poets themselves are extraordinary, especially the more talented ones. Before mass communication, people who worked in isolated occupations and were physically separated from the rest of humanity for long periods had to make their own entertainment. There are many examples of this. Fiddlers in, on ships' foxels and cowboys packing harmonicas along on the trail. A mate with a talent for memorizing, composing, reciting, or singing, or some combination thereof, uh, would be a welcome antidote to boredom in the bunkhouse, foxel, or trail camp. Several, several of my logger poet acquaintances remembered what they called camp bards, whose performances they remembered from their own days in remote logging camps, and whom they cited as inspirations for their own poetic efforts. In, in a 1990 interview uh, on NPR, literary poet Gary Snyder recalled hearing loggers reciting homemade poems in the logging camp where he had worked as a young man in Washington uh, and counted them as his inspiration to take up the pen. Narrative poetry, at least in the form of the lengthy epic, dates at least as far back as the 18th century BC, Epic of Gilgamesh, and probably further back into prehistory. It is, of course, also well known for the Mediterranean classical period and the Anglo-Saxon Beowulf, the Icelandic sagas and eddas, the historical epics recited by African griots, all are manifestations of this tradition. Many other examples abound many places in the world. The English language ballads presented by Francis James Child in his The English and Scottish Popular Ballads, which are mostly of 18th and 17th century origin, and their earlier predecessors on the European continent are much shorter than the epics, but continue the tradition of poetic storytelling. Despite the ballad-like structure of so many of their compositions, the individuals who composed contemporary Fisher and Lager poetry are more likely to have been exposed to rhymed couplet poetry through, through sources other than the child ballads, and I'll explain that uh, a little bit later. This leads us to the topic of recitation. It seems likely that many of the logging poems that appeared in industry publications in the last two decades of the 20th century were never recited. The last logging camps in the lower 48 had closed by then, and radio, television, and recorded music had already taken the place of homemade entertainment by then, and venues for public presentation were few and far between. On the other hand, cowboy and fisher poetry has had plenty of opportunity for public recitation. The former, since 1985 at the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada, and dozens of its subsequent imitators, and the latter, even having been shared on, you know, Fisher poetry, have been, having been shared on marine VHF radio on, uh, on slow nights. <laughs> uh, perhaps because Bush poet Banjo Patterson is a national hero, and there he is on the $10 bill, uh, Australia still has a tradition of men reciting Bush poetry for beers in rural pubs. Uh, Eastern Washington farmer and rancher poet Dick Warwick recalled how at least as late as the 2000s, when he went to Australia to work on header, that's Aussie for combine, cruise, 
He saw it happening around that country's grape, grain belt. Uh, both Lager and Fisher poems have been set to music and sung, often at public events. And the distinction between songwriting and composing poetry is often ambiguous. And both classic epic poems and traditional ballads were, of course, also sung. Oregon singer and songwriter and log truck driver Buzz Martin, who wrote and performed numerous songs about Northwest logging and traveled with the Johnny Cash show, uh, also performed and recorded several musically accompanied logging poems, uh, several on, on, on this album, in fact, in the style associated with any of you are familiar with Hank Williams's Luke the Drifter recitations, very much influenced by that. I first became interested in and involved, in involved with this type of material in the summer of 1984, when I came to the state of Washington to run a small nonprofit established to develop folk life programming for the Washington State Arts Commission in anticipation of the state's 1989 centennial. Uh, shortly after my arrival, I was contacted by Hal Cannon of Salt Lake City, who was in the process of organizing the first cowboy poetry gathering, now known as the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, to be held in Elko, Nevada the following January. He enlisted me to recruit a few poets from Washington to attend the gathering. Uh, in the process of doing that, I met Harold Otto of Pateros, Washington, whose photo I could not for the life of me find anywhere in my files or online, which is why uh, you don't get to see him, interesting looking character. And he recited a poem to, for me, Cows and Logs, about a couple of Eastern Washington cowboys who having heard a logger's pay was much better than a cowboy's, and I'm sure it still is, traveled to the western part of the state to try their hands at that trade. A humorous sequence of mishaps then occurs most of them based on misunderstanding of occupational terms. The two cowboys are indeed greenhorns in the logging woods. And Otto informed me that a similar poem from the opposing perspective in which he had read in a timber industry journal inspired him to write Cows and Logs. And uh, I later discovered what that was and met, met the poet and so on. It was my encounter with Otto and a first meeting soon afterwards with folklorist Robert E. Walls of Seattle, who was researching Northwest logger culture at the time and who later wrote an article for Northwest folklore about logger poetry, its structure and meaning. Um, and he led me to pursue logger poetry as a subject for research and given my new job as a folk life programmer uh, in public presentation. I soon found out that the monthly indus industry journal, Logger's World, published in Chehalis, Washington, we have someone here from there, I believe, often published poems sent in by readers. A meeting with its editor publisher, uh, Finley Hayes, led me to contacting loggers and loggers' wives who wrote and submitted poems to Logger World, Logger's World. Having worked as event staff at the first two Elko Cowboy Poetry Gatherings, I organized the first Logger Poetry Gathering held in May 1986 as part of the Mason County Forest Festival in Shelton, Washington. Two more followed, and the Cowlitz County Historical Society organized three more at a Grange Hall near Mount St. Helens. I also organized a series of seven combined cowboy and logger poetry recitation concerts at Seattle's annual uh, Memorial Day Northwest uh, Folklife Festival, and for about five years at the Cowlitz County Fair in Chehalis. And I brought three of them to the Elko Gathering in 1995 as officially um, invited guests. And I was about to say I didn't know that whether anybody was still doing this. And just a couple days ago, I discovered that at the Friendship Jamboree and Logging Show in Vernonia, Oregon, still has a logger poetry recitation event, which I just missed, by the way, because it was in early August. So I'm going to try to be there next year. During the first half of the 20th century, a number of folklore collectors documented so-called lumberjack ballads and published collections of them. Most of these were collected in the northeastern or upper midwestern states or in eastern Canada. Very little collecting was ever done in the Pacific Northwest or in western Canada. There are also examples of, I mean, there are examples of logging poems and songs found in very early publications, uh, newspapers in Quebec uh, that printed lines on the death Lines Upon the Death of Two Young Men in 1815, probably the earliest one that I could discover, and 
The Falling of the Pine in 1825, both of which were published in English in, in Quebec. Almost all the lager poets I knew, most of whom were of the generation older than the contemporary Fisher poets, mentioned at one time or another that they had been required to memorize and recite poetry in public school. A few of them said they had especially enjoyed this and that it led them at an early age to begin writing informal humorous verse, sometimes bawdy or scatological, and reciting it to their schoolmates. <laughs> informal conversations, and I have yet to t undertake a serious survey, maybe now that I'm retired I'll get a chance to do that, uh, suggest that many if not most of the occupational poets I've known were exposed to poetry in public school. Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Rudyard Kipling are a few of, of, of those whom my po poet friends have mentioned in, as learning and as m running into in school. Many of the Fisher poets with whom I have had this conversation refer predictably enough to Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner as a favorite. That happens to be my all-time favorite poem. I mean, <laughs> I used to know, I used to be able to recite parts of it from memory and I always made sure my kids got to he hear me read it to them. It just, I mean, it's just one of the most dramatic things I've ever, I've ever read or heard. Uh, the one poet most often cited, however, is Robert Service, Robert, whose Yukon repertoire was a major inspiration. His works are familiar and uncomplicated in content, narrative style, and meter, and they have, at least in the past, been widely popular in the Northwest. Another favorite was Robert E. Swanson, a British Columbia logging and railroad engineer and a protege of service who wrote dozens of poems about logging and railroading in the same style as service. Many of Swanson's poems were published in the 40s and 50s uh, of the last century um, as cheap chapbooks uh, and, and uh, several of my logger and cowboy poet friends cited, cited Swanson's chapbooks as their inspiration. And I did have the privilege of, of presenting Swanson at a couple of events, but he passed away, I think, in 94 or 95 or thereabouts. Interesting guy. Invented the train whistle that you hear on diesel trains that go whoo, that have the, the sort of dissonant notes. Uh, made a fortune from that, by the way. <laughs> um, now, regarding Fisher poetry, back around 1995, a poet friend who lived near the mouth of the Columbia River told me about a friend of his, a commercial fisher who not only wrote poems, but also read or recited them over the marine VHF radio during slack times at sea. Soon afterwards, I met Wesley Gino Leach of Chinook, Washington, who had by then left fishing and resumed his career as an able seaman, this time aboard a Columbia River-based salvage tug. And now he works actually on a dredging boat uh, down in uh, on the Gulf. In fact, I just had a conversation with him recently, telling him that I was going to talk about him in D.C. Um, Gino recited some of his poems for me and gave me some copies of it. And he also informed me that there was a move among some of the maritime folks in that region to organize a gathering of Fisher poets in nearby Astoria, Oregon. Chinook is really just across, you go drive across that five-mile bridge and drive another two miles west, and then you're in Chinook. So they're you know, really close to each other, but have some water between them. Uh, the first of these gatherings occurred at the Wet Dog Tavern in February 1997 and packed the house. Um, and it was organized by John Broderick of Seaside, Oregon, who taught high school English and creative writing during the school year and had, for many years, fished Alaska waters during the summers. Broderick had brought his high school creative writing class to the previous year's Elko uh, Cowboy Poetry Gathering. He and some other local people, working with faculty members at Clatsop of Community College in, in Astoria, organized the first Fisher Poets Gathering, which I then attended, and I've attended all of them but four since. And uh, well, I think it was, yeah, 1997 was when that happened. Uh, the Fisher Poets Gathering had grown into a much larger four-day, six-venue event, attracting poets from as far as Alaska, Hawaii, uh, the, and the East and West Coasts. Since 2002, the Port of Seattle has sponsored an annual Stories from the Sea contest 
with cash prizes at Seattle's Fisherman's Terminal, most of whom cont whose contestants are, po are poets. There's a, a pub in there called the Highlander Grill, which is where, where that event happens. Some of the better known poets have been invited to perform at venues around the country. New York City's People's Poetry Gathering, the, the, again, the, the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering at Elko, uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts' work, Working Waterfront Festival, the Lowell, Massachusetts Folk Festival, to name a few. Mostly, though, Fisher poems were recited at smaller uh, local commemorative occasions, private parties, dinners for maritime and fisheries-related organizations, such as the Oregon Seafood Association and the Columbia River Gillnetters Association. The local star power of a few of the poets' reciters occasionally leads to one of them walking into a local tavern for a beer and being asked by the other patrons to recite. Yeah, well, give us another poem, we'll give you another beer. Um, luckily, it actually, I actually witnessed that at um, the Fish Trap Tavern in Chinook when Gino and I walked in there to get a beer and people started shouting, oh, give us another poem. Uh, luckily, we were within walking distance of Gino's house. So they got to hear quite a few recitations, and we got to enjoy quite a few draft buds. <laughs> and I was told that it wasn't a unique situation. At this point, you might be wondering why the phenomenon of contemporary Fisher poetry mostly occurs in a limited area of the northwest coast of the United States. And there are a few possible reasons for this, and uh, it's an issue I have raised with some of my Fisher poets acquaint poet acquaintances. The nearby Oregon and Washington coasts and the Columbia River estuary were, until the late 20th century, uh, very heavily fished, very intensely. And as these fisheries declined and more opportunities became available in Alaska waters, uh, a lot of the fishers from the northwest coast became seasonal Alaska fishers, annually motoring north along the inside passage, about a six-day motoring or more, sometimes two weeks, uh, you know, for the, you know, for the Alaska resource. Summer season Alaska fisheries and opportunities to earn substantial pay in a single season attracted newcomers, many of them school teachers and college students who had time in the summer. Thus, a North Pacific fisher was more likely to be educated and familiar with literature, as was the case with Broderick and some of his, uh, his colleagues. The long distances from the west coast of the lower 48 to Alaska and the very uneven openings and closings by fisheries authorities up there provided long periods of relative inactivity at sea, punctuated by sporadic frantic efforts. Uh, women also entered the profession of fishing earlier in the North Pacific, in other words, in the late 20th century, first as boat cooks, then as deckhands, and ultimately as captains, as Aaron Freistad here became, perhaps because opportunities for making the big bucks on the water coincided with greater mechanization of fishing equipment. You didn't have to pull it all up by hand, and with greater acceptance of women in non-traditional roles. Now, let's talk about the poems. The first important point to make is that much of the poetry that I've encountered among these two occupational groups, as well as among people in ranching and mining, is narrative. In other words, it is the telling of a story. Uh, the most narrative of the poems display a clear progression of exposition, rising action, climax, and denouement. Most are composed as a long sequence of rhymed couplet stanzas. Rhyming is typically AABB, AABA, or ABCB, although some of the rhyme scheme and even the meter and the stanza structure sometimes change when a poet finds, uh, finds that necessary to advance the narrative because the narrative, the content, is the most important thing. And so the art is in the telling of a story, not in the being a good poet, but if you can get the two to work together, then there you are. <laughs> Whether or not a specific poem is a clear narrative it almost always includes a typical repertoire of content. But there are, however, some exceptions to my generalizations about meter. Some of the Fisher poets, at least, including Aaron, write in the more contemporary literary styles, a free, unrhymed verse, although, again, much of their content and narrative drive mirrors that of the more traditional poets. Contents of the poems deal primarily with the challenges of danger, with tragedy, 
adventure in one's life and work environment. It is often powerfully emotional, and it is the emotional content as expressed in the unfolding narrative that makes these works so compelling. Pride, nostalgia, sentiment, resentment, drama, fear, even terror are typical emotions expressed in these poems. Esoteric knowledge abounds in the form of occupational jargon. I, I thought of actually creating a, a, a little glossary to hand out too for some of the things, but I'll try to answer those. Some I don't know the answer to, in fact, <laughs> or I've forgotten, I was told and, was, and have forgotten. Reference to specific skills and tasks unique to the work environment and to its tools. Mastery of a dangerous environment and of complex skills are highly esteemed and thus major themes. On the other hand, some poems are comical and ironic. Despite the importance of the environment, many, if not most, of the poems are people-centered, either in the first person or in their descriptions of others. Vivid imagery places the listener or reader right into the environment of a narrative. Although women are among the poets and reciters, much of the content, including that composed by women, expresses experiences, values, and narrative style traditionally associated with masculinity. In fact, I've often referred to this genre as macho poetry. In fact, that was my first idea for uh, the title of this, and it was suggested that some people might object, so that's why I didn't call it that. But I think of it that way. Certainly, that's certainly the case. And although there are many women fishers on the North Pacific, there are still very few women who actually work in the Northwest woods as loggers. Logger poetry by women is mostly written from the point of view of the logger's wife. So let's look at some examples. And I've passed out four complete poems, which we'll look at last. And then at the very end, we'll listen to Gino Leach recite a Viking funeral in conclusion. Uh, except for two short examples, the ones I'm going to read to you are excerpts chosen to make my points. In the great Northwest, I've logged with the best and camped with the bad ones too. Why anyone stayed with the logging trade, I don't think anyone knew. Soaked with rain and racked with pain, I dragged to the bunkhouse door and then jumped like hell for the morning bell and head for the woods once more. Wear your corks with pride, boy. Stag your pant legs high. We have not logged at all, boy. There's more for you to try. And when the skies turn blue and the sun shines too and the snow is melting back, I long then to blow, hit the roads I know, and leave my winter shack. That poem, The Tramp Logger, was composed sometime in the early 1980s and after his retirement by the late Otto Oya of Kath Lamont, Washington. It has internal rhyme, it has a chorus, its, contrast, its content is heavily focused on pride of work and pride in work history and physical hardship. Considering that Otto was retired when he wrote this and that the tramp logger and logging camp lifestyles had almost completely vanished at the time he wrote it, it was certainly also an expression of nostalgia. I long then to blow, hit the roads I know, expresses the keen sense of adventure. Corks, referring to this, the caulked boots, uh, and stag, referring to cutting trousers uh, short to keep them from tangling in the brush, are characteristic inclusions of occupational jargon found in many occupational folk poems. Vivid imagery abounds in this poem and the one following, and I chose a Northeast example now just to mix things up a little bit. Um, it was, it was from a, a, a former Rhode Island fisher who's been a regular at the Astoria Gathering for years, uh, John, John Campbell of Exeter, Rhode Island. They used to haul home up the wind carrying dories in the oars, sailed out of the port of Gloucester, converted to the nets and doors. They cut the masts a few years back, leaving just these three short twigs. But you'll always know her by her lines, the last of the eastern rigs. By the way, that picture was taken in Astoria, not in Rhode Island. Now these boats of steel, it seems to me, don't offer very much, and it seems to me a welded hull is always cold to touch. I never liked those painted ladies with all their fireworks, and who could trust a vessel born amid the sparks? So I don't care if they lend me the money, because the banker never was his captain's friend. And this old boat, she's running smooth as honey, and there's dollars in the southwest wind. 
The wake she bubbles up like coffee, so we're setting out the gear, and if there is a God in heaven, she'll float another year. <laughs> so Last of the Eastern Regs by John Campbell, retired commercial fisher, still an active poet, singer, songwriter, and musician of Exeter, Rhode Island, and a longtime regular uh, at the gathering in Astoria, vivid imagery. Nostalgia for wooden watercraft, including a degree of anthropomorphism of, of the craft itself. Distrust of the outside forces, in this case the banker, to whom the narrator is beholden. Uh, pride in the competence of their work. Like many of John's poems, this is one that he's set to music and has performed and recorded uh, as a song. Now here's another one by Dave Densmore of Larson Bay, Alaska in Svenson, Oregon, depending on the season. And Dave is sometimes has a nickname, uh, Dangerous Dave Densmore. And in fact, Gino worked for Dave, and Dave was the first person that Gino knew of who did the reciting over the VHF uh, radio at night, and that's how he, uh, he got interested in doing that. I'm out here on the road learning to drive a truck because for years I just worked on deck. They say that's my tough luck. Hell, I'm not crying sour grapes, and I don't want a giveaway, but 30 years on the ocean should earn some rights, I'd say. Well, I know the laws I can't change once they're set in motion, but I just don't believe that it's a pencil pusher's ocean. <laughs> Dave Densmore <laughs> takes the distrust of outside forces to the degree of resentment in this poem titled For Those on Deck. Resentment is an emotion often also heard in logging poems composed after logging began to clash with environmental protection, as in the following example by Craig Jenkins of Mapleton, Oregon. Uh, Craig was part of a duo, Craig and Terry, who performed in logging communities with a band during the 1990s economic crisis uh, associated with the shutting down of the woods to protect, protect the endangered spotted owl. Society has turned against us now from the lies that they've been told. The press, the media, and some opinions have been so biased and bold. It makes me wonder, how did we exist? Looks like now, like the spotted owl, we've made the endangered list. Now, here's a different take by Dave Densmore. I hear the rigging begin to hum, doors and windows set to rattle. And I know that wind and sea and I will soon be locked in battle. The bow goes rocketing toward the stars, then falls off in flying spray. Once again, we're just hanging on. Can't make her pay this way. Wind is my nemesis. Ocean's my home. Seems I always seek big water, no matter where I roam. I don't quite understand this trilogy we form, but it seems to be my destiny since the day that I was born. And in that poem, um, Wind, Densmore's pride in his seamanship skills, as well as his questioning of his own destiny, are closely tied to his choice of a working life in a difficult and dangerous environment. Now let's look at some of the women's poems. The author of the following poem, Erin Freistad, worked Alaska waters over 20 years eventually becoming skipper of her own fishing boat. And she is now a professor of creative writing at Goddard College's Port Townsend, Washington campus. In Advice to Women Deckhands, Freistad warns that expectations by male shipmates of women's roles continue, at least for women new to the trade. And note that it, unlike the others we've heard, is written in a literary poetic style. You will be the cook. In addition to wheel watches, working on deck, unloading fish, fueling up, filling fresh water, mending nets, grocery shopping whenever you come to town, you will also prepare three meals a day and two hearty snacks to go with coffee. You must keep the kettle on the stove full and the juice jug and two gallons of milk in the fridge. Another woman fisher poet, Jen Pickett of Anchorage, Alaska, writes of the physical challenges she have faced, has faced in her poem, Free. Pickett and Freistad were two, uh, and actually I th believe they were the two first women owner skippers in the, you know, in the North Pacific waters. I may be wrong about that, but I, I'm pretty well convinced of it from talking to them. 
getting launched from my bunk in Shelikov Strait, spend hours upon hours not sitting up straight, the ramming, the jamming, the reaming and screaming, hopes of redeeming yet another season. The cold wind, the cold water, eyes full of jellies, all this slaughter for fish for our bellies. The sore arms, sore back, sore neck, the numb hands that won't work. The moldy cheese, the curdled milk, that cook is a jerk. <laughs> no sleep, no rest, no fish, no money. Weeks out at sea, no word from my honey. <laughs> Logger's wife, Darcy Cunningham of Buckley, Washington, writes these two short poems, devoted, or, or wrote these two short poems, devoted and siwashed from the perspective of a logger's wife. There's pride in her eyes, for she knows he's the best, as turn after turn he is put to the test. A kiss means so much as he goes out the door. She knows one mistake, and there won't be any more. But her smile disguises all the fears held within. She whispers, I love you, and hugs him again. Her love is made stronger as she goes on her way, just having the hope at the end of the day that he will return with the kiss that she gave and bring her the strength to face a new day. Now here's Cy Washed. Howdy, he says. I can just see the grin as he gives me a call to say where he's been. The guys were all thirsty and raws. He's here too. They yarded me in. What could I do? <laughs> Timmy's arms are bending. Here comes the round. I'll be home soon as we drink this one down. But I knew for sure as I hung up that phone, it'd be a while before he got home. Now, we've handed out uh, or allowed you to or encouraged you to pick up uh, copies of four complete narrative poems. And I don't expect you to read them all here, and we'd be here all afternoon if I read them to you. But uh, if you look at Otto Oya's Ballad of the Mount St. Helens Ape Man, it's a humorous narrative of two loggers who encounter the legendary creature and use both their toughness and their skill as loggers to prevail. It first appeared with illustrations in, an, in, in a um, 1964 issue of Chainsaw Age, an industry <laughs> publication. It is comp comparable to and was probably inspired uh, by Gail Gardner's much older cowboy poem, Sierra Pete's or Tying a Knot in the Devil's Tail. Humor, exaggeration of loggers confident and fearless machismo, trade jargon, and tool mastery abound in this poem. The ape man has appeared on the mountainside, and everybody's fled except for two there were who chose to stay and take a look around, a pair who never turned for home till timber hit the ground, big one-eyed Jim, a chainsaw man whose name all loggers knew, for he had traveled far and wide wherever timber grew, and Slabwood Bill, a bucking fool, from somewhere on the sound, whose chainsaw roared a hungry tune and logs did roll around. They'd take on any foe they'd meet and fight with knuckles bare. No ape man roaming logging roads could stay the famous pair. They gathered up their gas and oil and buckled on their packs, and heading up the mountainside, spit snooze upon the tracks. And then there's the confrontation, which progresses with them falling an old growth fur on the creature. Then Slabwood with his chainsaw flew with speed you seldom see. The sparks were flying from his corks as he tore down the tree. He bucked that gent from head to toe and made a long butt too. His chainsaw roared and never hung as fur and fire flew. No more the ape man roams these hills a hunting logger's souls. He lies up there among the crags up where the thunder rolls. And uh, what's interesting is that after he had written the poem, a neighbor of his who was a high school music teacher set it to music as a song, and they hired a local guy. This is when he was living in Detroit, Oregon, in Northwest Oregon. Uh, hired a local singer to make a demo, a tape demo of it as a song. I think the song is just great, but uh, it was never released or nothing ever was done. And uh, I think I have a third or fourth, third or fourth dub of the demo, so it didn't even, still a great, still, still makes for a great song. Far different is The Hooker and His Lady by late Woody Gifford of Seaview, Washington. It's a tale of love, the civilizing effect of a woman companion, danger in the logging woods, and ultimately tragedy. And it is loosely based on a real incident in a logging camp where Gifford 
had worked as a young man. It is a consummate display of sentimentality mixed with nostalgia. And the little occupational term, hooker in this case refers to the rigging crew boss, also called the hook tender. And the rod, when they talk about the rod, is the camp rod who was in the old logging camps a worker who relayed instructions and commands from the camp boss out to the various uh, crews on the various sites. It was in the high lead days of the 20s on the Blue Ridge logging show. The rigger was pushing the outfit because the hooker was taking a blow. Down in the resort city just to get away from the show. He would be back in a fortnight all fired up and ready to go. You could see Big Dan the hooker, his broad shoulders filling the door. Quickly he stepped down the crosswalk between the track and the camp warehouse door. Big Dan sort of hesitated, and his face seemed kind of red. Then down stepped a well-dressed lady with a wide-brimmed hat, wide hat on her head. The boys glanced round at each other, but nary a word was said. We knew too well that if we had of, Big Dan would have smote us dead. Uh, so the woman civilizes Dan, hangs curtains in the cabin, plants flowers by the door, uh, and Dan skips the payday evening poker games because the lady is waiting supper and I'm going so as I won't be late. But one day tragedy strikes and Dan is fatally injured by a falling log. The rod was coming fast like with the lady at his side, her face white as death and her eyes were set and wide. Big Dan was sort of drifting off but he sensed the lady was near. He opened his eyes as she stifled a sob and then held him fond and dear. Dan, Dan faintly smiled and tried to speak, but his words we could not hear. The end was closing in fast. Thank God the lady was near. She seemed to freeze in that last embrace, clutching him close to her breast. So softly she spoke and kissed his brow and then laid him down to rest. Now, the ride, also by Dave Densmore, <laughs> recounts a near fatal shipwreck in the Bering Sea in the late fall that ended well only because of an unlikely coincidence and the brotherhood of all who go to sea. It's a tale of sheer terror. It's the long one, the one that's, that's got four sides to it. After an engine room explosion and fire destroy their boat in just a few minutes, Dave and his two shipmates have spent three days and nights without food or fresh water in a damaged life, lifeboat in a blinding blizzard. This is the Bering Sea now. If any of you watch that uh, dangerous catch, you know what, uh, or dead, I was a deadly catch, I guess it's called. Um, you'll know what I mean. With enormous waves breaking over them and with one wet coat between them. So here's the excerpt. The fourth night, the winds eased up, and just before the dawn, I saw a set of running lights, and they were coming on. Port starboard and both range lights were aiming straight at me. So I stood up in the boarding port, the better for to see. And suddenly it dawned on me why well, I could see all their lights. They were coming straight towards us, and they had us dead to rights. I started trying to rouse my crew, yelling, Grab a paddle, we're about to run down, be run down. They just sat there ignoring this hallucinating clown. With curses and kicks, I finally roused my engineer from his seat. By then it was too damn late. We were right there at their feet. While well, Jan dumped up for the anchor flukes, I braced for the canopy crown as that ship hit the raft and flipped us upside down. It seemed I was driven a quarter mile down into the Bering Sea. When I came up, I was under the raft. Stray lines wouldn't let set me free. As I struggled to get free, one thought kept coming down. I gotta get loose. This would be a hell of a time to drown. I finally got clear and burst to the top. Jan was on the overturned raft, screaming and shaking his fist at the ship as it went sliding past. And after that, the story takes a turn for the better. And all are rescued by the Japanese trawler that had rammed them. Because just by chance, one of the deckhands was out by the rail and happened to see them down there in the water. Even more dramatic than the ride, although out of respect for, for its author, I leave it to him alone to share it, is Skeeter's song a lengthy true account of how Dave Densmore helplessly watched his father and his son drown in waters off Kodiak Island after a boat mishap. Like the ride and wind, and for those on deck, Densmore unfolds the story in rhyme. And there's the key. These are primarily stories, each told 
for the sake of the story itself. Poetry gives them a rhythm and a structure that accentuates their dramatic element. The meter and prosody, sometimes good, sometimes fair, but it emphasizes the drama of the story and thus makes it all the more listenable. Now, finally, let's listen to Gino Leach recite a Viking funeral. Again, think of my politically incorrect nickname for the genre, macho poetry. And as you hear it think, although a man or woman might run away from an overwhelming problem, I think I can say that the big guy's spectacular exit was for better or worse, distinctively masculine. And the story itself, like the others we've looked at, it looked at epitomizes their poets' topics and sentiments that are explicitly situated in the bounded and knowable world. And just before I, I play the poem and hope to God that it works when I click it, um, I'd like to concede that this presentation posits at least as many questions as it answers, and I'd welcome feedback regarding the directions I should take for further study. And take those four poems with you as examples of some of the better dramatic storytelling by Northwest occupational poets. And of course, they're all copyright their authors. So here's a Viking funeral. Well, this guy was all cargo, not flotsam or jetsam. Stood six football four and his gurried Ballard Stetson. He wore a gray filson jacket and black Frisco jeans. They were splattered all over with Norwegian green. Well, he hiked his bulk upon a stool. I tossed a coaster down. He threw down a hundred and said, buy the house around. I rang the bell, up on a yell from a crowd of waterfront rats. Their ship had come in. They wore beer grins and slapped each other on the back. Well, this guy was big. You know the kind. They fill up a door. He smelled like diesel fuel and stank of albacore. His face was brown as running rust, had hands like coffee cans. His wrists were like vine maple. He said, I'll have myself a ham. Well, after three beers, he got up to piss. The jukebox was howling some old Hank Williams shit. Then through a screen of cigarette smoke, Kodiak Chris leaned over and gave me this dope. He said I fished with that guy. He had a death wish. He fished like a drunk and drank like a fish. He's from Eureka as a slab called Blue Star, and he blows every dime in a Vista Del Mar. Well, the big guy came back from pumping his bills. He bought round after round with a fistful of bills. The stiffs were ecstatic. God, what a racket when he fit them all out in green tavern jackets. Well, there's an hour to go before last call. He said, I'm going next door for some real alcohol. See, I drink beer for bulk and whiskey for blast. I'm going over to Red's and get drunk on my ass. He said, by the way, I got a plan. When I go out, I'm going out like a man. I ain't using no gun. I ain't using no rope. See, tuna's my game, and the bank wants my boat. Well, I just stood there. Hell, I didn't know what to think. Yeah, I let it slide. It had too much to drink. Well, next night at the tavern, I talked to old Pops. He worked pumping diesel at the Union Fuel Dock. He said, remember that big guy that bought us all jackets? That guy from Eureka that created a racket? Well, he come in with Blue Star drunk in his ass. And got underway with two drums of gas. Well, one week later, the story came out. I got it from Larry, who'd run up from down south. The ocean was flat. They were onto the fish. They're all close to having plug tuna trips. Well, here come Blue Star with one busted pole. Figured the big guy had been on a roll. He ran past the midnight. He ran past the king. He ran past the Trojan and past the Doreen. He kept on a running way out to the west. Blue star disappeared into a red-orange sunset. Well, out on the horizon, they saw a bright light. It glowed for hours well into the night. At daybreak, they found her, but they weren't in time. Blue star had burned her water line. Well, all they found was a note and a quart bottle of hams. And here's what was printed in a block-lettered hand. I'm gone to Valhalla, 
I went like a man. I done what I could. I did all I can. All right, that's it. Thank you. So yeah, I think we have a few minutes. I'm not sure. You'll have to let me know what the and yeah. So and I'll be glad to entertain questions. Yes. Well, certainly the, the, the occupational jargon, certainly the, some of those content uh, uh, contents that I mentioned earlier, but uh, in terms of actually composing them, what I have heard from at least a number of the Fisher poets, and again, this reflects the, uh, the, time, uh, the time that they're out there on a boat with, not a whole lot else to do except to motor on, uh, is that they'll get a, a, a few lines will just kind of come to them. They'll, they'll be thinking about something, and they'll rhyme a few lines, and they'll jot them down on something, and stuff in their pocket and then later on they'll do something else and then eventually it'll kind of come together uh, come together for them um, the logger poets that I knew and, and all but one of them are now deceased they they the ones that, that I knew they actually sat down and come, they were the ones who had been exposed to poetry as uh, poetry memorization and recitation as kids in school and they would like you know sit down and Cook up a cook up, cook up a poem based on some experience or, or, or some thought, and that would also be the case for uh, some of the more literary poets. Erin Freistad being the example that I gave, but she's certainly not uh, certainly not the only one. But uh, you know that's really what uh, that it, it varies from individual to individual. But I do know that several of the Fisher poets and and Gino, although he no longer works as a fisherman, is is uh, you know still on the water. Um, you know, three weeks on, three weeks uh, home, and so on, and and that's it's just these a couple of thoughts come together, and you can rhyme them, and then later on you just kind of have the opportunity to put, uh, you know, tack the rest of it on. Other yes, um, I I perform on the maritime music scene, which has some crossover with the Fisher poetry. Mm, definitely, scene. and there's a a poet who's now become extremely popular in the maritime music world. She was a, a late 19th, early 20th century poet named Cicely Fox Smith, uh -huh. an English woman who, uh, who uh, spent a lot of time in Vancouver among sailors. And she wrote sailor poetry, and she wrote it under the name C. Fox Smith so that nobody would know she was a woman uh -huh. in those days. So everyone assumed she was a sailor um, at the time. And now she's become, I mean, everyone on the maritime scene perform some of her poems set to music. And I'm wondering if you've encountered her as a sort of Robert Service figure, if anyone on the Fisher poetry scene has, has started to use her as a model. I have never heard that. And I've, in fact, uh, I'm ashamed to say I've never heard of her. Okay. But uh, I would bet that John Broderick and some of his uh, school teacher buddies, likely, they probably yeah. are. Because they, they sing as much as they recite. Mm -hmm. I mean, they think of themselves as poets, but then they write a poem and they set it to music and... Uh, and then they end up sitting there uh, singing and doing a great job as uh, as as, uh, as songwriters. And they're from they're from Washington, um, and and we do get British Columbia uh, poets at the at the Astoria gathering. So uh, that's a good question, and it's something that I definitely need to look into because I did not know that. But thank you for. Uh, in fact, would you mind emailing me? Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, email me that that clue, and yeah. uh, I'll I'll uh, you know ask around. Thanks. Someone else? Yes. 
Well, uh, they've certainly gotten together. I've had uh, two different times. I brought some uh, logger poets to the uh, National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in, in Elko in 95. And I think it was in 2001 or 2000 or thereabouts that I brought some to uh, some fisher poets to Elko. And then uh, back when City Lore used to have those uh, uh, biannual um, uh, people's poetry gatherings in New York City, one of the years they had a whole session on, on uh, occupational poetry. And I brought the, 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 <clears throat> the loggers and the, and the fishermen. And, and by the way, fishermen is really what people use out there. Even, even the women primarily refer to themselves as fishermen, uh, although the gathering is called the Fisher Poets uh, Gathering. Uh, but they end up talking about this, this a lot of the same problems, uh, particularly uh, oh, everything, government regulation, I can assure you, is a... Uh, is, is, is something that, uh, that, that's, uh, that concerns them. And people not understanding them. You know, the people of uh, the rest of the country, you know, the vast majority of, uh, of uh, people not understanding what their life is like or what they're doing. I think it was uh, Sir Walter Scott who said, it's not fish you're buying, it's men's lives. And, uh, you know, people just not understanding that and not, not understanding, for instance, when they think of loggers as, oh, they're cutting down all the trees, not realizing that we use more wood per capita nowadays than we ever did in, 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 in the past. And how difficult it is to, uh, to, to fish because of, you know, the resource has been overfished. The, there's also been damage to the ocean by, by um, acid rain and, 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 and pollution and so on. So there are a lot of the same kinds of things. The fisher poets are the ones who tend to be more environmentalist oriented you know they have that uh, they, they have their feet in both camps uh, much much more but definitely those are there are things that they and I, I can remember them hearing from people from the all of those uh, occupations afterwards saying well we're kind of like what they did well, they're kind of like what we did there was a poem I tried to find and I have it on tape somewhere and dang if I can find it called uh, don't talk to me of rodeo and it's from the very first uh, fisher poets gathering and it's a, a, a fisher uh, Alaska fisher who had been sitting on a plane and there was a rodeo cowboy sitting next to him and he talked about yeah for 18 seconds I stayed on or you know <laughs> or, and he said what are you talking about for, for, for a month I was out there in the same conditions in the Bering Sea you know with ice under me rather than a saddle so so there you, know, you, you get that aspect too and there is a I can't remember the name of the guy there's a cowboy poet who always comes to the fisher poets gathering for some reason, he hit it off with those guys when they were in Elko, and he loves to come, and he recites his cowboy poems, and wow, he's welcome there, too. Uh, quite a few of the people, um, I would say maybe a quarter or a little less, maybe a fifth of the recitations or readings at the Fisher Poets Gathering are prose as well. There's some great prose stuff coming out of there. There's a woman named Mo Baustern who lives in Portland. That's not her real name. I think it's Laura Mulvaney, but she... Her nom de plume is Mo Bowstern, and uh, she's an Alaska fisher during the season and lives in Portland as part of the sort of Portland uh, uh, punk performance art scene, and just wonderful stories, and she has a series of zines that she's put out uh, called Extra Tough, spelled with an X, and they're named after uh, a... Um, a brand of, of rain gear that, that fishers use. And her stuff is absolutely wonderful. And she is, of all the women fisher poets that I know, she is definitely the most mach, macha, I guess I have to say, of, <laughs> of, of the bunch. And just, uh, I, I realize I've gotten to know her personally and, and uh, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful storyteller and amazing singer and, and just does, it's really in her element when she's performing. But then she's up in uh, Alaska waters and you know, sometimes in the summer, sometimes in the winter, depending on where the openings, uh, when the openings for what she does are, are gonna be. So anyone else, question? Okay. Well, we can, you can stick around informally. Yeah. For, but for right now, I'd just like to, to thank Jens Lund again for coming for this great talk. And- um, Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And uh, our next Bakken lecture will be on September 20th. Franklin Odo, who used to be with the Asia Division here, will be talking of, also about poetry and song uh, called Voices from the Cane Field about um, 
Japanese poetry from the from Hawaii, and it should be a very good talk. More but occupational poetry. More occupational poetry. But well, thank, thank you. you again for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It was an honor to be here, and thank you all for coming too. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.